during a tour that Anthony and I had. Um, his name is Zachary Levy. He has like a new Marvel movie or one of the DC movies coming out. Jesus, I cannot believe they got in this vehicle. And I go to change to like third gear and I just blow right through it. The ship just go, and I was like, all right, everybody, like I got some good news and some bad news. The bad news is we lost first and third. All we got is second, fourth, and reverse for the rest of the day. Who's still with me? And we don't care if we gotta fucking push this thing. Let's do this. Do you ever wish you could quit your job and pursue your dreams? Maybe that lingering business idea that's been in the back of your head? This isn't another series about million dollar ideas. Bizpirations features stories of everyday people, people just like you, people just like me, but the difference is they chose to take a chance. 99% of people will stay exactly where they are. These are the 1%, the other 1% that chose to be different. Let's dive in. So Maddie, thank you for being with us today. And before we dive into your jump from mortgage broker to Costa Rica tour operator, What's a relevant story or thing about you that we need to know before we really dive into that? Um, I would say that I've always had like a, a pretty relatively good affinity for create, well, not creating systems, but within the confines of systems, how to get the max out of them, um, how to take one thing and take it to another level. Um, like as part of my vision, I can work within systems that are created and really squeeze every drop out of it. And that's kind of what has translated so well here. Um, Brian's amazing at creating, like, um, laying the brickwork and the foundation for a system that we have here. And what I do best is finding all those protocols that make the most sense in the capacity of the tour itself, the logistics, and more importantly, security, which is the biggest component of all this, but how to perfectly mix that adventure with the level of security that, you know, blankets all of that, which is why it is very family friendly and so successful ultimately, because we have the scope of very small children and, you know, people that are elderly. Um, so that and the ability that I've always had in my life, like through all the different types of opportunities and career paths that I've had, um, coupled with my like athletic abilities, comparing, pairing those two together has translated really well in this industry. So who is, who's Brian? Uh, Brian is my business partner. Um, both of us are from New Jersey, relatively close to the same area, which is ultimately how we've come to know each other. Um, our story is kind of like a full circle. It's funny, the first time we ever actually met each other and worked together was at a Bertucci's. <laughs> um, he was a little older than I am, so I was a, I was a dishwasher and a bread maker, and him, um, he was a, a, a server at the time. Um, we didn't know each other that well back then, but we figured out that that was the first time we had known each other. Um, but our relationship and our acquaintance uh, started more so in the mortgage industry. Um, when him and I both worked together and a buddy of ours, a uh, smaller brokerage, and we sat next to each other. Um, and at that time, I was in my early 20s and uh, had been traveling to Costa Rica a fair bit since I was 17. Uh, my father brought me, fell in love with it a great deal the first time. I was um, enchanted by like the topography of this place. I'd never been anywhere like this, even just in San Jose, landing to that mountain strip there. Um, I was pretty blown away by it. Um, and I remember San Jose was the place that turned me into a coffee drinker because I hated coffee as a youngster. Um, but then we went to like the Denny's, I believe it was. And I, I was like amazed by the coffee at Denny's and like Denny's, as you know, in the United States, like serves you crap coffee. You know what I mean, <laughs> here it was like the most d d delicious thing I've ever had. It was super silky. It was like, didn't even need to put cream or sugar in it. I'm pretty amazed by that. But then I came back when I was in, like 19 with my father one more time. And then I believe when I was about 22, backpacked like uh, Panama, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica um, for 40 days with a buddy of mine. And then from there, my family ended up purchasing a home in an area called Playa Bajuco. So I had like an established relationship and during the course of those vacations, and I would go back home after on vacation. During that time, I was working with Brian and I would, like was always sharing my stories and he had uh, an interest in those stories. He loved the idea of Costa Rica. Um, and we always chatted a lot. Our cubicles were right next to one another. We also got to know each other and like um, our dealings in business and how we worked, what our, eth what our work ethics were like. Um, and we both kind of had a mutual respect for one another, made some money together in that in industry. And um, I moved on to a different brokerage, I believe. But then Brian ultimately got out of the business a number of years before I did. Um, so I stayed in for probably about eight or nine years. But by, from what I understand, Brian made his way to Florida and then by way of Florida ended up here in Capos. Um, he had another business partner, Mike, 
Um, and Mike's family had a boat in the boats. There are boat slip rather in the Cape Os Marina over here. Um, and they were looking for an opportunity to kind of change the game, change up their life. And that opportunity led them to where we are, Manuel Antonio Capos. Um, but we did communicate when he opened that business, which was called Pariso Water Sports. And he was like, yo, I'm in Costa Rica, dude. Um, we're doing like parasailing tours and little inshore fishing stuff. We're kind of just throwing, excuse my language, shit at the wall and seeing what <laughs> sticks, which is what a lot of people do here. It's kind of what you got to do. Um, he's like, but I don't know what I'll, I'll have opportunities. Are you still in the mortgage game? Blah, blah, blah. And he's like, maybe you can come down. And I was like, I love that. I'd love to hear from you again. And he, Brian's not a big social media guy. Um, so he kind of fell off the map for a little bit. And then ironically, I think I was at that time still in the mortgage game or not, maybe if it wasn't mortgages, there was other things that I did in the real estate world on the financial side, given the market in the economy at that time. Um, but um, I also had taken an opportunity when kind of the, the wheels fell off of our economy to get take my exit out of the financial industry and the, then mortgages and whatnot. So um, then I was actually myself living in Florida and I was coming back to my studio where I was doing like manual labor. I was doing tree work and things like that, kind of just completely switching it up. And I walked back into my studio and this is when Google Voice came out. My computer rang. So I didn't even know that that was a thing at that time. And I was like, how do you answer this thing? Like I just hit a button and he was like, go, it's Jeezy. And that's our nickname for him back then. He doesn't like to be called that anymore, but in Jersey, that's where you all call them. And I was like, dude, what the hell are you doing? And like I said, he's not a big social media guy. So that's how we communicated before through Facebook. And um, he had the Paraiso Water Sports Facebook and he just kind of like let it go by the wayside. So we weren't communicating on that anymore. And when he, when he called, he was like, look, man, you know, things are good down here. But I'm looking to switch up the model a little bit. When I came down originally, we were doing parasailing, which we still do. But we had I brought eight paddle boards with me, and I've been doing paddleboard tours. And I lived in Fort Lauderdale at that time, and in intracoastal paddleboarding was very popular. So I hadn't done it much myself. I did go a couple times. Um, I don't know if you've ever done paddleboarding, but the first time you do it, it looks a lot easier than it is. It's it's very important that you have someone trained that helps you get up. Um, so my experience was I fell off a bunch of times and he was like, did you ever paddleboard before? And I was like, a couple of times. And he was like, yeah, well, he's like, look, I'm doing this thing. We're switching the model over. I want to call the company paddle nine. We're going to move everything over to doing paddleboard tours in the ocean and the mangroves. He's like, do you want to come down and help me like maybe be a uh, paddleboard tour guide? And I was like, I don't really know shit about paddleboarding. Um, but yes, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Can I curse? Is that okay? Yeah. You say whatever you want. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> and he, and he, I was like, and I was at that point in Florida, um, not, I wouldn't say in having a tough time, but I wasn't, didn't have really any deeply set roots. Um, the social scene there was not really to my liking. I was doing like hard labor for not a lot of money there. Um, so I wasn't really like, I didn't have my way set at all. So this opportunity, I was like, it was very much something that I was willing to contemplate. And I think during the, the length of that conversation, I was like looking at my lease like, how the hell can I get out of this? All right, I'm going to get out of this. And I had a motorcycle there. I had like a Honda Magna 94. That was like my social life. I used to ride that like to the Everwaves and the Keys and stuff like that. Um, and like a, a longboard, a nice TV account. So I'm like, all right, I can sell all these things and I can get down there and I can make this happen. And in the course of that conversation, I figured out how to get out of my lease. Um, he's like, and I was like, when do you, when do you think you want me down there? And I thought he was going to be like, ah, like six months. He was like, well, if you could come tomorrow, that'd be great. He was like, but I realized that's not realistic. And I was like, and I think it was, um, I don't remember precisely when he called. It was probably like sometime in like March or a little bit before that. I don't know what month comes before March, February. <laughs> February comes before March. Um, but I came down April 2nd. Okay. So it was 10 years in April 2nd that I've been here now. So I'm going on my 11th year here. We'll be at 11th year in next April. So, And, and uh, <clears throat> tell me about like, Tell me what was going on when you were getting on the plane to come down here. Um, it was, see, I will, I will say too, that's why we're, we're in the process of potentially looking to open another location in another part of Costa Rica. Um, and it gives us something else to kind of a new adventure, the unknown, the uncertainty, but like betting on ourselves. That's how I felt coming here because it was the beginning of a, a great adventure. Um, just only knowing Brian, only knowing that what my relationship with Costa Rica was, but that's what made me be able to make the decision was I had enough of an established relationship with this place that it wasn't 
just by the wayside, like a completely, um, you know, uh, fly by the seat of my pants decision that I like had never been to the place. I was like, all right, I have no idea what we're going to do, but I know what I'm capable of from working with Brian. I know what he's capable of. And I imagine that us together, what we will be capable of together. Um, so that was the, 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 what I was betting on the entire time. It's what we have always bet on this entire time. Um, and I just remember when I bought that ticket and it was really official. And I remember the photo that I took, um, like I simplified my life. And I remember like I had my like 70 gallon backpackers backpack, like another little small one next to it. And like, that wasn't my whole life. There it was. And like, it was this one photo. I remember I put it on Instagram. It was like next, I was at my mom's house and she's got like this little dresser thing where you put mail and all that shit. Um, and it was like the dressers decide all my luggage, like kind of was smaller than that. And I was like, all right, this is good. This is where I need to be. Cause like my life before that was like complex and there was a weekend warrior and making great money, but I was living for the weekend. You know, we have all been there if there's trials and tribulations. And, um, that was something about the financial world that I had left behind. Um, that I knew that I was like permanently leaving behind for like this con consistent sense of adventure and like. I had no idea what the fuck we were going to do. I didn't know. I knew we had a, pl a, a plan. I knew we had a basis for doing paddleboard tours. I knew that I was no good at paddleboarding at that <laughs> moment in time. Um, but I do know that I'm, I'm an athlete and I knew I'd pick it up. Um, so I just took every day step by step and uh, just constantly believed in myself and believed in what Brian was capable of. And that's how we've been doing it ever since. But uh, I remember getting on that plane and I was just looking into the future. And I loved that I did not know what was going to happen. But I knew that the world was ours at that time, whatever we wanted to make it. And that's a feeling that everybody, you know, I, that I, I look to gain again through this new project that we're going to do because it's a, it's a nice feeling. Do you remember your first paddleboard tour? Like when you were in charge, like take me, take me there. No, well, I, so the, I'll answer that in two parts. I remember the funny thing is the first paddleboard tour that we, and this is in 10 years, this has never happened again. But my first paddleboard tour because I came here, got my legs wet. Like I, I learned how to paddleboard like substantially over the first week. Um, I'm a waterman. I surf now. Like those things like, you know, I've like snowboarded and skied, skated, or skated my whole life. Um, so it took a little bit of trying, but I figured it out. Not that I would call myself a professional tour guide paddleboarder at that point, but I was working up to it. But the people that booked the, our first paddleboard tours, Brian was like, all right, we got our first tour that you're going to do. It was like two semi-pro paddleboarders <laughs> that wanted to paddle from Maracas to the national park and around. And if you, you know, for the viewers at home, you don't know what Manuel Antonio looks like down to the park, but there's all these large rock formations out there. They wanted to paddle out and around those. And I'm like, holy <laughs> shit, dude. And like from the land, they look far, but they're a lot farther than they actually even look. And completely unprepared for it. Um, they brought their own cooler. They had those big sombrero hats. They were lathered head to toe in sunscreen. They had like rash guards. They even had like, like pants on. And I showed up in like board shorts and like a t-shirt and like had a tangerine and a bottle of water. And I was like, all right, let's do this. <laughs> We, that was obviously a mistake. Um, I, as you can tell, just by the measure of things that they brought as far as hydration was concerned versus what this is. Brian had that too. It was the two of us. We just were like, all right, let's just wing this. Did not go. The tour went well, but thankfully they were very good paddleboarders and essentially didn't really need us. Um, so we got like to the park, which took probably two hours. And that's, that's usually the length of our entire paddleboard tour, two and a half liter on the water for two hours. And we were like, not even remotely close to done. And my, my, like my measly pull and spring eight ounce water bottle had run out a long time ago. And I was like hallucinating and like having visions of like drinking under a fountain and stuff like that. And I literally actually had to, uh, I was like, I'm sorry, I'm completely unpre underprepared for this. I bribe was too. And I'd explain the, the the newness to the situation and that the chances of them being our first tour were extremely unlikely, but here we are. Um, and I now need to leave you because I need to get to shore because I am incredibly dehydrated and sunburned. And they were like, don't worry about it. And they were like paddling next to each other. They had their cooler just like this, like said between them, they were like chewing on grapes and drinking juices and stuff. They were totally fine. Um, and we just had them paddle straight into the beach when they were done, which they did. I don't remember like, completely full well now how long much longer they were out there but brian and i ultimately had to like leave them 
<laughs> like him. And just saying it out loud now is crazy, but they were very grateful for the experience. They were very um, um, experienced. And also it was the, during the summertime, which you know the waters in the summertime are very calm, very flat, very relaxed. It's much different than like say now um, where the, there's a lot of swell. So it wasn't like we had to worry about them d disappearing or we can see them most of the time. Um, so, but my first experience was ultimately about four and a half miles of paddle, um, <laughs> on one little tangerine, no sunscreen and a Poland spring bottle of water. And, uh, it went like, it sounds like it should go when you paddle that far. Yeah. It sounded like it worked out really well. <laughs> yeah. Fantastically. But it was a story to remember, you know, those are the things that build character. Um, immediately learned what not to do, how to not be prepared for the rest or how to be prepared, what not to do the next time. Um, and that was, that was my first real paddleboard tour. And how has Paddle 9 evolved from then? So you started off doing paddleboard tours. Mm -hmm. And I guess let's kind of go into like some milestones. So what was the next kind of change, next change, next change, or milestone that you reached? And how did you guys get there? Um, I, so, and it's funny because we, Brian and I, like, we'll just still have these conversations these days to ourselves. Um, you know, where we were and, you know, where we came from and where we've gotten to, um, and how we just ultimately used to do business. And more importantly, that it was acceptable or accepted <laughs> by other people. Like, all right, this is good. This is what we're doing. Cause the way that we operate now, so insanely systematic, so much safety put behind everything. There is a protocol. We have a, a, a guide, a manual that's this thick that talks about like, every step in stone that you have to go through. If there's an emergency, where you go, the numbers to call, um, we're an ICT like certified company. You have to have these things. Um, and the fact that we can put this comprehensive manual together that itemizes each step for everything that we do versus things like that, where I was like showing up with a Poland spring water bottle and like had, oh, let's do this, we're paddling. Um, we have come leaps and bounds by far and away to another level of operation. Um, but I think, as I said, at the beginning of this, I mean, one of the ways that you operate here as a new business, especially from another country, is you throw shit at the wall and you see what sticks and you make mistakes. And that goes with any business that you're ever in. If you make a mistake, one of the mottos that I live by is make it big because it's going to leave a it's going to leave a core memory. It's going to be a shitty memory, but it's you're going to not ever do that or make that mistake again. It's going to leave a wrinkle. You're going to know that next time you approach a situation like that. And when you make a mistake like that, or in this business, it ha it holds a lot of weight. You know, there's safety elements to it. You know, maybe somebody could get hurt or like it puts you in a situation where there's some trauma, something like that. That's why we are so cognizant of everything that we do, even in the small stuff, every detail that we just don't ever want to live those moments. We don't want to put people through a situation where that it's already a big decision to come to an adventure country like Costa Rica that when they get here, we take all of that unnecessary risk and that guesswork out of them um, so that they're comfortable with the decision they've made. We want people to say good things about Costa Rica because it is an amazing place. Uh, but we also realize that a lot of families that ultimately come to Costa Rica, they usually go to Florida, you know, and go to an all-inclusive resort where they don't got to think about any of these danger elements. But you're like, you know what? Let's take it up a notch. Let's go to Costa Rica. It's only another couple hour flight. It's not too far away. They speak another language, but they speak a lot of English there. There's all these decision-making factors that go into deciding to book a, 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 a trip to Costa Rica. Um, so we now know that there's so much, not on our shoulders, but weight that we can carry in a positive manner to give the deed or put all the work into the details that they don't even know themselves need to be made or decided upon. And in our reviews now, when you go on TripAdvisor, you that is reflected in those reviews greatly. So I would say that when we came from the, that level of operation, the mistakes were made, um, the new protocols were put in place each time with each new thing to realize how far we need to stay away from stuff like this and the elements of like safety, like life jackets mm -hmm. and proper precautionary measures like clothing, sunscreen, all of that, that we can give them recommendations before they go out. Because not everybody, um, as far as paddleboarding is concerned, would ever even be as prepared as those people. They have obviously lived a journey of quite an extensive amount of paddleboarding so that they know the steps that they had to make. When we get customers now, they're first timers, you know? We're the ones guiding them. If we don't tell them to put on a hat, put on this, you know, wear these shoes or don't wear shoes at all, put sunscreen on now. We're going to be on the water for a while. 
Um, so it's on us to make sure that they have that information so that they can do the things successfully. Um, and that was a great le first lesson for us to learn. You know, it made the bill real high. We learned a lot of mistakes that we made immediately right off the bat. Instead of, I guess, to say in the a way, if the if a tour was super easy the first time, we wouldn't have known the little tweaks that we would have had to make. In this case, we were like, we missed the mark by a million points right now. Here's what we need to do next time. And that was because it kind of really was such a, you know, a big blow for us because, and again, I, I like I said, that's never happened again. We had never once been approached by another family that we want to paddle for four miles around the national park. So that's never happened again um, in 10 years of business. Um, so in a, in a way, it was a blessing because it showed us the spectrum of how far people are willing to go. And it made us understand all of the elements that we need to create, all the details that we need to cover to create that experience in the event that it does come to us and everything inside of that. Um, and then, so that was the, that's just the paddleboarding aspect. And then from there, um, the big next step up for us and what has really brought us to this level is the, the waterfall tours that we do. Um, and that was birthed from paddleboarding because when Brian and I used to do the tours and um, another one of our guides, Anthony, we used to, um, you get comfortable with the customers. And the big thing about our tour company was that they would always say, we don't feel like we're on a tour. We don't feel like we're with tour guys. We feel like we're friends or family who were just shooting the shit without on the water. And at that time we were going to waterfalls. The one, one of the main ones that we do now are most popular is our full day waterfall tour. Um, there are three smaller waterfalls, but with a lot of levels of interaction, jumping, swimming, sliding, and there's ultimately no hiking. They're very easy to get to. So all members of the family can get there. Um, whether you have a small child or whether you have like an elderly member of the family, the oldest guy that's ever done our slide was 87 years old. 87! Let's go! So there's not a lot of arduous hiking to arrive at those locations. Um, and anyway, my point is we would always be talking on, uh, while you're, while you're paddling, you're shooting the shit with your customers. This is what you're doing. So how like the same way you're talking to me right now about my story, those people ask those questions. And when you have the answers and they say, well, how did you, uh, you know, how did you get down here? You know, where's your paddleboard? What do you do on the weekend? Well, the answer to that question at the time was, oh, we go to these waterfalls. What waterfalls do you go to? Do you got waterfalls here? Oh yeah, of course we got waterfalls here. And then we would explain it in detail. Oh, this one's got a 25 foot slide or all oh, this one's got a 30 foot jump or this one's a smaller. Wow, that sounds really amazing. And when you're speaking passionately, it interests people. It sparks people's interest. And they say, well, you guys seem really cool. Do you guys do a tour there? Well, no, not really. But well, how much would you charge me to make to take me there? And like the light bulb went on just like this one right here. Um, <laughs> And we were like, right. yeah, nice and right. And we were like, well, wait a minute. And the key thing for um, Paddle Nine and Brian and myself was that as um, guys, as they call us here, gringos from the United States, building a business in Costa Rica, one of the main components is that we didn't want to, we never wanted to step on anyone's toes. We essentially wanted to blaze, trailblaze our own way um, so that we didn't have a lot of interference. Um, not that there would be interference, but there's a lot of competition here, you know? Um, so, and that's the thing about us with paddleboarding is nobody had paddleboards here. We literally pioneered paddleboarding. We were the first people to bring, I don't know about the country, but at least the, the central Pacific and Southern Pacific area, uh, there were no paddleboards to, that we knew of. Um, and then what we did from there, um, when we created this tour, um, like the path that we go on, we, we, it like, again, like, just like the paddleboarding, it was pretty haphazard to beginning. We, we would have a couple different waterfalls that depending upon that day, depending upon the vibe of the customers, how we were feeling, we would just load up the vehicle and bring the customers there. Um, but we, we started doing the waterfall tours and they started to have some great success. We made some mistakes out there as well and realized that there's a lot more safety required there, even more so than in paddleboarding, because you are taking people into the jungle. You're walking on um, not necessarily manicured paths. There's very slippery rocks. There's roots. There's areas of water that need to be depth checked. There's new flows. There's new rocks, things of that matter. So during that time and over the years of evolution, we learned a lot about ourselves, a lot about safety, and a lot about how to take all of that said guesswork out of their experience so that they can enjoy it um, in a way that's safe for the entire family. But the biggest leg up to got, get us where we are now was ultimately those conversations with customers that we had a great rapport with in paddleboarding that ultimately chose us to do a tour for them based on what we like to do in our own time. 
and nobody was doing that tour. The full day waterfall tour, we literally created the, the, the route. Now there's a bunch of companies that, that literally have, I would hard per se copy and paste in our business model. There's no other way to put that, but, um, there's a lot of them because they saw the, you know, the, the simplicity not the simplicity of it, but, um, how well it works. And as long as you do it efficiently, it's a great, it's a fantastic tour. And now that you started doing the waterfall tour, do you have more people doing paddleboard tours, more people doing waterfall tours? This, this bad boy's nice and dry. <laughs> it's probably been there for a little bit now. Sometimes these city are, uh, I think we had some paddleboarding the other day. And one of the tours that we do, the the waterfall tour that we do, has an option to do paddleboarding first. It's like a, it's like a refresher paddle, if you will. Um, but we still do plenty of paddleboarding. But there are times in the season when these things are out of the water for a month or two at a time without being used, and we are just jammed up with waterfall tour after waterfall tour. And I, I you know, digress a little. We have that tour. But we also do two other waterfall tours that we do very well. The most popular that we have is the full day, but we also go to another place called Nayaka and Echo Chantalis that as part of our inventory have gotten more popular now as well. When we were doing the waterfall tours in the beginning, the only one we did, we did Nayaka sometimes, but the main one was the waterfall full day. Um, so now in addition to having more inventory items like those other ones were there's, I mean, we just get so much waterfall tour business. There was a time when we like, thought about like selling off all of our paddleboard inventory and just doing waterfall tours we obviously decided against it and now we even do we like we doubled down and bought kayaks so we have kayaks and stuff too um but there was a time where we were just getting so much waterfall tour business and these were just sitting here for so long they were like should we just like simplify this and like do i put just waterfall tours but we didn't but um i think probably 80 percent of our business maybe 70 now because the other ones exist is the full day waterfall tour. So it sounds like, you know, shifting from paddle boards to the waterfall tour was a big milestone. And, and since then, what, what other changes have you made uh, within your business to kind of further that progress? Um, it's a good question. I think the one thing that has worked for us so well and why it's been successful. And I think this kind of translates and it correlates to other things in life is that, um, we've allowed things to happen very organically, just based on the needs of the market um, and finding, you know, a need and creating a solution for it. Um, and ultimately, like the main component that we are so big on here is safety and the small details, like just the little nuancey type things from email to overall experience and, you know, how much we help our customers in every step of the way on each of the of the tours. And just through creating rapport with other customers, we've listened to what their thoughts are about things. And um, ultimately, them enjoying our services on a paddleboard or waterfall tour capacity so much that they ask about booking other tours with us. And we've like learned what their interests are. Um, and these things are already done here as well. But one of the things that we do, um, we have added other inventory items. So we have these really amazing kayaks. Now, kayaking is very popular here. But one of the things about Paddle 9 is we kind of always try to take things to another level. So instead of just getting like those regular kayaks that a lot of people have, not that there's anything wrong with them, we were like, what's the most new, innovative, like edgy technology that they have? So one of the cool things that we got is these really amazing Hobie pedal and paddle kayaks, um, which have been pretty popular. Um, and it like, and again, you know, I'm kind of jumping around here because a lot of things have happened and a lot, we've hit like a, like term, not terminal velocity, but we've hit another level of speed over the last course of the years. Once we've really figured out systematically who we are and what the Paddle 9 model is, because it, we always knew what it was, but we didn't come all the way into it. You know, like there was a system that we had in place, but we had to like figure out how to trim the fat here and tighten this dial here. And we've done that very well. And through that, we've learned how to operate and create other tour opportunities and use some really cool stuff to change things that are already going on here and kind of implement a paddle nine style to it. Um, and I would say that the, the, the kayaks is one of those. And then in addition to the full day waterfall tour, we do two other waterfalls that we go to. Um, and the, the depth of interaction with those tours, like I said, the little details. And then also like a big part of that, um, once we started getting really busy and we've always outsourced our transportation, um, 
we found a need to obviously purchase some of our own transportation. Um, so we purchased a bunch of, um, because even down to beyond just the tour itself, it's, you have to pick the people up. You have to safely navigate them from one location to the other in style and comfort, you know, because there's a big part of our tours that, um, you know, we're in the vehicle, um, you know, specifically the waterfall tour, the first one, um, we drive from location to location. So you want to be getting in and off of a nice vehicle each time. So we, we invested in nice, three nice vehicles. Um, we have two big Toyota coasters, which hold 28 people. You want even has, a, um, uh, they have their own refrigerators in there. So the water stays nice and cold on the hot days. People really appreciate that. If they bring their own snacks and drinks or things like that for the ride, we put them in there for them. Um, but in that kind of, I also touch on that. So in addition to not only transportation, I would say the level up that we've had the ability and been blessed enough with the amount of business we've had is the, the year that we're able to purchase. I mean, we have like top end or high end everything. Like we have Yeti dry bags, um, all of our paddle boards, like these are um, boat boards. They're extremely good. The ones that we used to have, it, I don't know, the camera can't see it, but there's these old epoxy ones, which we got off of like Alibaba.com. <laughs> Thank God they did a great, they did a great job. They definitely held their weight. You know, they were earned their weight in gold. Um, but we were been, we've been able to upgrade our inventory so that even when people come um, and start to live the experience, they know that they're getting the best of everything from the transportation to the gear that they're using to the level of athletic capability and safety that the guides implement um, so that there's like really no stone unturned where the family does not feel like every dollar that they've spent has gone to all of these things that they see around them. You know, we have life jackets for every person. We started doing um, surf lessons too. We don't really market like surfing, like at the beach and stuff like that. It's just customers that book directly through us and then ask about surfing. We'll do that. Um, so we got some cool, like soft top foam boards, but we have these wave storms. We got nice leashes, NRS straps. So we just try to really, we, we, we pull all out all the, every stop, man, we pull it all out, um, from start to finish and top to bottom. So I think that's a big thing about what the business model of paddle nine is that has allowed us to continue to ascend to new heights. People see it, people feel it. We're passionate about what we do every single day. They're comfortable. They're safe with the gear. They feel like they're elderly family members with, we get people with knee surgeries. We'll put extra guides on the tour. Um, like just so that the ratio for guide to client is higher to make sure that if that person needs an extra assisted hand, there's like a guide specifically there. So that grandma and grandpa can be on the tour and watching their family, even if they're not jumping or swimming, it's still an experience for them to see it, whether that's on the waterfall tour, whether that's on a paddleboard, whether that's on a kayak, we want everyone that comes here to be able to do the things together and to be able to create that experience. There's levels of service and safety that must be implemented so that you can do it and do it safely and as well as efficiently and create that experience for them. So they're not, you know, you have property managers, so they don't have to be like, all right, I have 10 people from Jolly to Sally to Joe here. You too will like this tour, but you guys won't. And we don't like to create that dichotomy there. We don't want to split families up. We want to keep them together so that they can enjoy the totality of the experience together each day. You know, we obviously get different varying circumstances where people have to be split up sometimes just for whatever reason, but we want it to be possible for the whole family to come together. Um, and that is what has really leveled us up in the eyes of um, travel agencies that we work with. Um, you, know, one, you used to work with one of them, so you know full well um, how much business they do. They're a great partner of ours, but that is also symbolic of the other relationships that we've created that have allowed us to pull in some really great business for companies that really vet their tour operators and vendors long before they will ever send a customer there. Um, so it's allowed us to take those leaps and bounds upward to create an experience that other people have noticed You know, across the pond in the United States, other countries, locally, and other parts of Costa Rica that uh, we've made a real good name for ourselves. that is basically uh, on the back of safety and detail-oriented, efficient business. Um, like I said, it starts with the first email until, until the, the last, the, the moment we drop them off, we, we squeeze every drop out of it. You know, we uh, live by the motto here, like, is the juice worth the squeeze? And we try to squeeze all the juice here. <laughs> when, uh, <clears throat> so you mentioned you have, what, three three vehicles in total? Uh, we have th it's through like three, yeah. And we have a, a four tuner as well, which we use for really small tours. 
but we have a 2019 um, Toyota Coaster. Then we have a 2022 Toyota Coaster. And then we have like a 2020 Hayase, all Toyotas. So, I mean, what was it like? You know, take me to the day you guys decided, hey, we're going to go, what, $100,000, $150,000, $200,000 in debt yeah. to take on these vehicles? I mean, um, was that intimidating? Like, were you like, oh, what are we doing? Like, is this the right call? Like, take take me to that day where you guys are signing. So, and I'm not going to lie. That's that, if, if Bri were here, he's the one that kind of would tell you that. And Bri is, uh, he's our numbers guy. And he does an amazing job at it. Um, if I was in charge of our money, we'd have been bankrupt a long time ago. <laughs> I can sit here and, you know, scouts on her on that because that wouldn't be the case. Um, Brian has a spreadsheet for everything. There is not a dollar that comes in or goes out that he does not have a pulse on. Um, and Bri, I mean, I think it was pretty simple for Bri. I mean, it's an intimidating decision to go out and make a $100,000 purchase. But when you break it down to what we had in the bank at that time, the deposit we were capable of making versus the payment that it would induce from us, the interest that we got from Toyota versus what we were spending on an outsourced basis to other transportation companies, it was like, it was a scary decision, but when you looked at it analytically, like all acidic numbers and stuff, it was kind of like, this is a no brainer in a capacity because if we continue to do, the only way it could have really screwed us is if like somehow the faucet just got turned off and like nobody came, like a pandemic, for example. <laughs> but we didn't, um, I think, I, I can't, no, the first coaster we got was before the pandemic. So when did the pandemic happen? 2019? They, they closed the border March 19th. 2020 okay because i had started with crv in november yeah and i was like oh this is great i got a new job i'm making money i moved into a big house march 15th and then four days later yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> turned the offset off and it was like oh great by the way you still have a job don't worry but oh it's gonna be an interesting yeah 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 whatever yeah, month yeah. from here I can't honestly like it all kind of blurs together. I can't remember. I, I feel like we had the first coaster before the pandemic, mm -hmm. but that's a prime example. So it was like it just analytically looking at the numbers, like projection wise, like there's no reason to not get it. Yeah. Um, it actually the first purchase like saved us tons of money because, um, I mean, we, you know, we have our drivers. We knew we put drivers on, you know, at that time we had one or two drivers on Planilla. Um, but, you know, Brian's good at crunching numbers and based off salary, maintenance, you know, fuel insurance and our payment uh as long as business was staying on the trajectory that it was on it was well worth the purchase 100 percent, and it felt nice it was awesome i, I will say the, the day that brian and i went to toyota to get in that first one and saw that brand new baby and it smelled like a new car a big ass new car <laughs> um you know got in there and uh, turned it on you know and we're at toyota signed the paperwork it's a nice feeling i mean it's those are those are the 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 cool moments when you can like physically appreciate you're moving forward you know um even if it's not like there's something about getting a vehicle you know it, it always ends up being like you know when we're younger getting your first car or getting your first new car or out of a lead whatever the case may be there's something appealing about that experience but when it comes down to like a commercial purchase that means you have created enough wealth or made enough good decisions to be able to do that and do it, you know, successfully and within with confidence, it was a good day. It was a good day. It was a good day. Like you see it, you know, the day you're walking out of your office here, and you see your bus pull oh, up, I love like it. with still, your name on the still, side instead of I still love it. another to I another still. transportation company. Yeah. Every day, that's a little reminder. Yeah. No, that's a great question. I didn't even like it until you just put it that way. I love it. Um, two of our vehicles are wrapped in paddle nine. We have to, we still have one, the newest one remaining, which I'm like, we just need to, it's so busy that we just haven't had the opportunity because mm -hmm. they have to take it. It takes a while. They tint it. And you like all of our, um, buses have like the paddle nine logo. They're wrapped in like, uh, like waterproof seating inside. So we get that real done real nicely, but we bang that all out in one shot. So it's all, they, the, the van has to be gone for like probably 10 days. So we haven't really had the opportunity to do that. So I'm dying to get the third one wrapped. But yeah, uh, yes, the day that the Paddle 9 logo came back, the vehicle was tinted, and it looked so fresh. It looked so fresh. It did look You're like, this is mine. Yeah, yeah. That was nice. It's nice. It's still nice. Yeah. It was really nice the first day. It's still nice today. Yeah. And what have you seen, like, industry-wise that's changed since day one until now? Um, in, in terms of Costa Rica or us personally? Both. 
um, yeah, uh, like the the evolution of Paddle Nine has been very, um, you know, um, closely tied to the evolution of Costa Rica on the world scale. Um, it's gotten a lot of great press over the years. Um, it's been, you know, like itemized quite a bit in a lot of sustainable and green commentary, which is obviously due to climate change and things like that, a big note of topic. Um, and Costa Rica has done a good job in marketing itself in that capacity. Um, in addition to like word of mouth, when people come, you know, they go back and say great things. Um, and there's just been a lot of that happening with Costa Rica. So we've seen a big uptick in um, just overall tourism in Costa Rica. And we're located, as you know, in Manuel Antonio. Um, and I think Manuel Antonio has gotten a lot of good press. It's not without its shortcomings, like anywhere on the planet, any tourist area is going to create and attract positive things, a couple negative things. But I think we do a good job here of uh, creating a really good family environment for the whole family to be here um, together and have good accommodations around so that they feel comfortable after their adventures. But um, I would just say that we've, as Costa Rica tourism has grown over the years. We've positioned ourselves really well to grow with it. I think that if we weren't doing the job that we were doing, um, you know, and, and you know, there's always like spillover business, but I think that we've really positioned ourselves in a way that we're not getting, we're not receiving leftovers. We're like at the epicenter of when people arrive, they know about Paddle Nine um, to the point where there's many days where we have to say, no, I'm sorry, we don't have any space happens all the time i just remember this is the you know this kind of brings up but that's another cool moment like there's the moments when you're buying a hundred thousand dollar vehicle and then there's the moments when like we used to sit in the house when we didn't even have an office and operate from our bedrooms and answer emails take phone calls and i say that like there was a lot of them happening there were it was like if we got 10 emails in a week we were fucking killing it now it's like we get 10 emails in a fucking hour mm -hmm. i mean it's i mean there it's 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 insane I mean, I think the other day, Brian and I, like, we were in the office, and he was like, dude, we got uh, like like 45 new business emails. I think it was like 3 p.m. that he showed that, and he like started looking from like, uh, like, from like 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Well, okay. like it, in, in like six hours. Yeah. 45, and it was all new business. It was like insane. I mean, 45 emails back when we were doing it before would have been like, what the hell are we going to do? Yeah, it's like about... Now it's like, you know, again, look, when we started to, you know, when we did this paddleboard tours, it was two people. Then when we had like a 10 person tour, man, it's all coming back down to too. Cause we did this really cool paddleboard. Um, like one of the things to break into getting houses in the villa management to like notice us, we piggybacked off of paddleboarding, but paddleboarding's cool. It is cool, but it only goes so far. There's a lot of other opportunity here in this country. So to like get houses to recognize us for the waterfall tour that we created, um, we create we were like, how do we get into the houses? How do we get to know the parents? Beyond like rubbing shoulders, shooting the shit out the bar, like that what people do socializing, but like really showing like our, you know, flapping our wings, peacocking a little bit, showing our safety, showing our skills, showing our athleticism, showing our concern and, and detail oriented services that we have. We had to get the parents to see that. And we created, and I came up with the idea for uh, the Paddle Nine Kids class the subclass. So after school, we did a paddleboarding class for young kids. So it's like bringing your kids to soccer or something like that. But the parents would pull up, we put the kids on boards, put them in life jackets, paddle them around in maracas. The kid, the parents are kicking up, uh, you know, their, uh, their little, um, what's it, a lawn chair and sitting and having a young beer or something, watching their kids paddle around. And it got us to create a rapport with them. And then the first villa that we got that started sending us larger tours because that house slept 17. That's like a moment in my mind was uh, friends of ours, Laurie and Bob. Um, they had a, a, a Villa, like Via Grande. It's back by Villa Lirio back there. Or not Villa Lirio. Uh, yeah, Villa Lirio. Mm -hmm. um, that was the first time we really landed a place that would like, they started sending us groups of like 10 to 15. That was a huge deal for us. Um, which now it's like, that's like regular every day. Um, but it's, uh, that was the first time we were like, Fuck, we got it. We got it. We got it. We got a hook. We got a fish. You know what I mean? We're like, and, uh, we did, we really focused on them and, and really serviced our clients quite well. And they were happy. And then they are, you know, social in the, the circle of other property management, other business owner families, and other people started trying us out. And we just made sure to, when we came up to bat, we hit a home run, you know? Um, and, uh, we've come a long way. There's many more guides now that at that point it was me, Brian, 
Anthony, and I think maybe Ismail may have been with us. I don't even know if Ismail was with us yet. Um, he's been with us like seven years. So I think at the most part, it was like me, Brian, Anthony, like doing everything, like all the clerical stuff, administrative stuff, boards, clean, like the whole nine. Um, and yeah, we, uh, we would, and we just, and we were, it came down to personality though, as well, because like the tours weren't as well put together as they are now. Like it's very militant now, which is kind of, that's my big thing. We're big on vetting, you know, our, our guides that will be accepting and, you know, knowledgeable about that. And there's steps that must be taken. Um, but, uh, back then it was just like, let's, let's see what's going to happen here. But, um, we did a great job, you know, creating good report. Those clients, they would go back and tell their you know, their property management that this was very well done tour. And like, very honestly, they'd probably be like young guys, like, you know, like maybe could have some more system, but they're going to evolve. They knew we were young, mm. you know, and, uh, and we were just only way. Right. Yeah. But so far so good. And it just, as we've grown other places, you know, have, have, you know, have, have taken note and, uh, we've continued to up. We constantly just have re, growth rebranding missions and meetings about areas that you know can be dialed a little bit more tightly and we don't ever get like complacent um i think for brian and myself complacency is like the devil we need to feel like we are always moving forward i think here that there's like you can be that way here like you can find your niche and just stick to it i just don't like personally to be like feel like i'm stagnant mm -hmm. i know brian doesn't either and I know that a lot of our guides don't either. Like they like change, they like new, they like adventure, they like to level up. That's a big part of our our, our motto here, um, and that kind of shows. So, in the course of the years that you've had this business over ten years, uh, tell me about some challenges you face and what you've done to overcome them. Um, I have like a, a CBS receipt list size thing of challenges that we've had to overcome, but. Um, we were, you and I were talking earlier and there's been a couple funny things, you know, some things that have been serious um, and some things that are just like quirky little things. But at that moment, it was like a huge issue. Um, but looking back on them now, um, and we were talking about the evolution of the company and things that have happened during that time period, you know, and things that kind of go along with the, the, that part of the evolution. And one of the things we were talking about was our transportation. Before we had nice transportation, we had transportation um and i said earlier it's funny how people kind of like accepted what it was that we had to offer and we're like yeah this is good this is what the tour that we're gonna do and a big part of that was um we used to have we had our own transportation it's funny because there's there's the evolution of 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 transportation you have your own transportation which is usually really shitty in the beginning <laughs> then you uh, graduate to being able to afford to pay for transportation because it's expensive. It's easily one of our busy, biggest expenses. The biggest checks we cut are transportation bills. Um, then you graduate to being able to have your own transportation. And that we're taking it back, rewinding to back when we had our shitty own transportation and um, the vehicles that we had. We had a, a nice um, a Ford Expedition. Um, it was a terrible purchase though. I mean, not to fault Brian for it. He had no idea. Gas is very expensive here. We had a v V8 vehicle. I swear, like when you hit the gas, you could like see the meter go. And it was like quarters were like flying out the exhaust pipe. But we that was like a seven seater. So we used it for small stuff and board transportation stuff. But we did have our original baby called Blanquita. Um, Anthony will like this story because he was there. Um, God, that thing had to be from, I, I want to say the late 80s. I'm not sure, but you see a lot of them. If you come to Costa Rica and you look around, you'll see this old Hyundai. It's called the Hyundai Gracie. You've seen the Hyundai Graces. They're old. Some are still in really good condition. That was not ours. <laughs> ours was um, beat up to start, but it held thir it had sat 13 people in it. I mean, the seats were rusted. It, I mean, it just it's like a jalopy, but like a tube jalopy. Like, just imagine that. Um, look like a caterpillar, a white caterpillar with wheels, kind of. Um but we used to pick customers up at that and they would get in it and be like, let's do this. We're ready to take on the day. But, um, she was faithful for a long time. Like, it did, like, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of what was going on inside were pretty like, she was just a, a, a trusty steed, if you will. She just wasn't very pretty. Um, but one day all those good looks came crashing down, um, during a tour that Anthony and I had on the full day waterfall tour with a, uh, a celebrity 
Um, his name is Zachary Levy. He's been in some of the uh, Thor movies. He's like the short. Um, he's got short blonde hair. He's one of the swordsmen. He's he's on. There's a show called Chuck that was very popular for many years. And he has, I think it's called Shazam. He has like a new Marvel movie or one of the DC movies coming out. Um, I'm sure if you look him up, you can see him. But anyway, he's uh, him and his friend who was one of his partners on Broadway and her whole family and his assistant were the people that came on this tour. And we were informed that we had like a celebrity on the tour that day from the person that sent it to us. Um, so when we picked them up, we were pretty excited about it. We were doing our research, but, um, we picked them up and we still, this was in our early days that we had this Hyundai Gracie vehicle. Um, there was no problems with it. Cause that's just how we did business. Like that's what we had. So we just kind of went with it looking back now. It's like, Jesus, I cannot believe they got in this vehicle. Um, but actually two things happened that day. Um, but the main thing that pops out is on our way to the first waterfall, I was driving, mind you, now we have, you know, professional drivers and things and chauffeurs and the whole nine. Now I was like, I was driving this vehicle, but I knew all the nuts and bolts and bells and whistles of this baby. So I'm driving the car and we're getting to Ovita and we're like, I'm changing gears. And I go to change to like third gear and I just blow right through it. I feel it. I feel the gearbox, like just nothing happens. Like I feel the, the ship just go. And I was like, Oh, so I was like, Holy shit. And I like, and I was like, and you know, like with cars, you like, you know, it's not good, but you're like, maybe if I turn it off and turn it back on again, it'll fix itself. Like, that's what you're hoping. Like, it's a, like a game system or something. But in my mind, I knew full well. So I real quickly, like, did not let anybody know that this was occurring. Anthony was in the front seat. Though. I was like, dude, we just lost like third gear. Like, so I was like, all right, we're going to get step. We're going to stop and get snacks. So there's a, it's called a Bay M.A. There's a, a super center there in the little plaza, like in the center of town. And they were like, cool, let's get snacks. So I pull over. I'm like, Anthony, you got to take them in there and like get them some snacks and stall. Like, let me see if I can figure this out. Turn the car off, turning it back on. I like looked under the hood. Like I knew what I was doing. I'm not, I had no idea. I'm not a mechanic. I'm just like, please fix yourself. And then I realized the, the, the extent of it, we lost first and third. And for the remainder of the day, we had second, fourth, and reverse. Maybe fifth. I think fifth was in there. Um, and so, anyway, I, I come to the realization, like, I have to accept our fate. They start, I see the, you know, the group coming back out with Anthony. He's looking at me like, is it fixed? I'm sending him signals. No, it's not fixed. And in that moment, I was like, all right. And I was like, the honesty is the best way forward. And I was like all right, everybody, like I got some good news and some bad news. I was like, the good news is the vehicle still works. The bad news is we lost first and third. All we got is second, fourth and reverse for the rest of the day. And I was like, who's still with me? And they were like, like there was a slight pause, but it was amazing because the energy was already really good on the way out. They're very animated. They're actors, Broadway actors. They were already singing, doing interpretations, but they were like, we don't care if we got to fucking push this thing. Let's do this. So and I had known the tour well at that point. We'd been operating for a little while. Um, it's not like it was like the first year of business. But I had to make sure for the rest of the day, anytime that we pulled into a location, a new waterfall, I had to park semi on a hill because first did not exist. So I had to get like enough of a roll into it when I took it out of like the handbrake so that there was a slight roll and I could pop it into second and like get it going. And I did it all the whole day. Successfully drove the vehicle with second, fourth, fifth in reverse and it was awesome um they had an amazing time there was a little mishap on the waterfall slide um that was one of the another moment that we learned a lesson um because we had like a different form of how we put people in the water now everybody has life jackets they're across their hands they put the guides we put you in there and that's kind of what we did back then but there was we there was a lot of instruction but we wasn't as strictly enforced about how you must maintain the position to go down it he the one the the one the dad of his broadway partner put his finger out and he caught like a little like a like a nick in the rock and he dislocated this finger and i noticed that it was a dislocation and put like a and we wouldn't do this these days but this is again we're talking about stories back in the day you kind of deal with with the situation as you ha as you got it um put a, a stick in his mouth gave us a bite down <laughs> pop, popped it back in relocated it put it back in the joint and then we had like a little mini med kit wrapped into the finger next to it um it was a funny story i mean i hope they don't see this but because I, because every he was okay ultimately, but his reaction to the situation was like he had a like a uh, he had a big reaction to it. Obviously, any but when he came down, he caught his finger, and when he 
he came up and I think his wife's name was like Shirley or something. He was like, oh, <laughs> and because this was like touching that, it was like sideways. And I had to see like I've dislocated stuff. I've had friendly. And I just could tell that it, I could tell it wasn't a break. I could tell that the G, like it did, it popped out. You know what I mean? I so. Yeah. And I <laughs> popped that sucker back in. But in the moment, everybody was very concerned about his well being. Once it was known that like it was a dislocation, it was t- like we gave him some anti inflammatory, we iced it, we tied it, and he like continued for the procedure the rest of the day. But nobody would let him live down his reaction. <laughs> Because he like, I remember when he came up from the water too. Like the first thing that came up was his hand. Because I guess he recognized that it happened underwater and came up, and it was like he broke the surface with just this finger. And I was like, oh holy shit! And I like see this finger, and I was like, so he was super bugged out about it. But we, you know, these things happen. Um, and he was he was okay. Um, but in that, and I I remember the and we go kind of go back. This is why I love Instagram. I mean, it commemorates you know um, in photo form all of your memories and things. That's why I like, they'd like have that archive and stuff. But when we, that's what I, one of the things that I've done for the, the company, um, cause I'm like social media guy. Like I do all of our Instagram, Facebook and photos and all that stuff and just content management. But that was, um, back in the early parts of our, our Instagram, that was one of the photos we put on there. Um, cause the, we all had great energy together. There was a great report, you know, with the bruised fingers and dislocated fingers and no gears and all that stuff, all that combined. It still amounted to a magical day, and we posted up at the. I guess it was Playa Linda. We used to the tour was a little differently composed back then. We used to get like we would do all of the stuff and then go to the beach at the end of the day for sunset. So it was a very long day. We don't do sunset anymore because we were getting back at like seven thirty at night. It was just a lot. But we posted up at our one beach and we like opened the doors, the front door, and everyone got on top of the vehicle under a nice palm, and we took a really cool photo at sunset with everyone surrounding around Blanquita, um, minus two gears, and the dude had his finger wrapped. Um, and that was on our Instagram, like one of the early, early days. Um, and that was cool. We still talk about that 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 story. I mean, it was just like, you know, life hits you and it comes at you fast sometimes, and it's like, what do you got to do? And I was just like, the only way forward is, you know, way out is forward, buddy. And we just, and they were super cool with it. And that, that day, I remember too, like they were doing like so many cool impressions and they were just great people. It was good energy. And we got lucky that it was them because I've experienced people, not that we have ever had bad clients, but we have people that that would have been very problematic for. that have been like, absolutely not turn this bus around. Like we're not going with you. You know what I mean? Like not everybody in life is like as comfortable with adversity like that. And we made the best day of it. So that was really, really cool. Um, but that's just kind of like one of those moments of all the, the myriad of things that have happened, you know, things will happen in the tourist industry. We take a thousand people out in a given month, you know, that the saying, the phrasing shit happens exists for a reason, you know, enough people come across your plate. Um, and that's, this brings up a great point about what paddle nine is and how we've gotten to where we are is because in the moments of, um, adversity, you know, uh, situations coming up that are unexpected and not preferred what makes a company is not when things are going well, it's when they go wrong, how we respond, the actions that we take, the care that we provide and how far we see it through. Um, and every injury that has ever happened in like, whether there have been like, like dislocations, stitches, a woman like just was standing and she slipped, her foot slid out and then her other ankle kind of buckled and broke. Like we've had it out, we've had it all. Um, but every single one of those people has then went and written a trip, a five-star review about the service that was then given to them in spite of those situations and how cared for and how well they were taken care of in during those situations. Um, and that's what we've always been very proud of because those people could have said a myriad of different things and they've taken to the review based platforms to say nothing but amazing things about our business. And that's when we learned we really had something so when those kinds of things happened and how we pushed through. Um, yeah, and that's something I always kind of move back to. So in the face of adversity, we, uh, you know, and that's kind of where my biggest, um, I guess you could say my sixth sense. I have like this first responder mentality. Um, I kind of just go into this like mode of like action and reaction. Um, it's very emotionless. It's just strictly about the care knowing what needs to happen and happen quickly. Um, and I'm good at like getting people to be where they need to be, do what they need to do, take the right steps of action. Um, in a timely fashion and people recognize that and the guides all do an amazing job with that now as well they're all trained up to a certain level um, they've taken courses and did trainings and certifications so that's all very important here for us um, 
but yeah, we've, we, we are not without adversity. We have not, not seen difficult scenarios, but each and every one of them, we've come up to them, we've faced them and we've overcome them and we've grown the much greater for it. And what, what kind of certifications do you guys put in place? And is it like CPR, first aid, yeah. first responder, that kind of stuff? Yes. Um, personally, as uh, cause I'm not Costa Rican, I can't, as one of the owners of the company, um, I oversee a lot of the things that they've done, but they have all been through rigorous licensing in classes that encompass like English, history of the country, play, um, information and education about the flora and the fauna, all of that. Also, the first basics are like CPR, first responder stuff, um, re like first aid, like how to bandage this. If someone falls here, what to do with the ankle, how to how to like um, secure this. They have been through tons and hours and hours and hours of classes. Um, not only about the physical capacity, um, you know, the other elements of education while they're out, the things that they can teach. And then when like a scenario like that arises, how to respond to it. Um, and we have all the gear for it. We have very comprehensive uh, first aid kits that have tons of stuff in them. We have stretchers should it need, like I spoke about that lady's ankle that broke kind of just like she was barely even moving and just like a little slide and just the weight shift. Um, we implemented, we have these collapsible stretchers. We popped her out on, you know, brought that up, threw her on that, got her there. Um, and then also, you know, people have, uh, injuries that they don't tell us about, which we ask extensively about, but it's sometimes it's, it's funny what people will hide from you, you know, for the sake of having an adventure. Um, uh, and I, I appreciate that, but I think sometimes it's like when push comes to shove, it's better to be wise about that. <laughs> Um, especially here in Costa Rica. So like, and then like something happens and then all of a sudden the floodgates are like, oh, I forgot to tell you, I had a surgery like three <laughs> months ago. It's like, oh. all right, two things. When you signed the waiver and two, when we were like, does anyone have any, like, this is what we were talking. I know, but I didn't think it'd be a problem. Um, and then it was a problem, but it, uh, you know, we've seen it all. We have seen it all. Sure. Pat and I, we have seen it all. Um, you know, and, and, and then the physical element of, customers on tour, there is adversity and scenarios that come up. On the the back end, the administrative aspect, there's a lot of bureaucracy in this country that you have to kind of overcome. Not that it's bad or, you know, misplaced, but um, I have learned um, resilience and patience is very important in this country because things, the reason the country's like there's Tico time is a real thing. Um, Pura Vida is a, a country slogan that gets applied to like everything including like things that should probably happen a little bit quicker than they do. It's like, yeah, poor me to get, get around to it today. Um, and that translates into like, yeah, like business. So like, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, we were talking about um, the transportation and it's like, you got to sign something, you know, but like we are in Capos and a lot of these things require signatures in San Jose and a couple, many times Brian and I have like driven all the way to San Jose to like sign paperwork and before the first couple of times we were like, all right, we just assume that we're going to be told everything we need to sign and they know what's best for us. So we show up, we sign. Okay, cool. See you guys later. We get back to San or Capos and they're like, excuse me, uh, Mr. Galloway, Mr. Rosenthal, uh, we forgot to have you sign this one document. Do you think you could come back real quick? We're like, we live in Capos. Took us six hours to drive there and back today. <laughs> no, we can't come yeah. back real quick. Oh, okay. Well, uh, can you come another time this week? Yes, yeah. we have. Yeah, we do. Do we have an option? No. <laughs> um, but then we learned that those things are. I don't want to call them common occurrences, but they happen. So then, in times later, when we were purchasing other things or doing more signatures, um, we would be like, "Is is this it? Are you sure? Are we good? Is there anything else I got to sign? Because I'm here. I'm here. I'll I will post up. Whatever. I will sign whatever. I will. I got all day. Let's get make. Let's make sure. No, no, no. We're good. Sure. We've signed everything. <laughs> Get back to Capos. It's almost like there's a sensor. <laughs> like the second you cross into like the Capos line, uh -huh. the phone rings and you're like, Mr. Galloway, Mr. Rosenthal, uh, yeah. forgot to have you sign this stuff. Great. <laughs> yeah. And there's nothing to those to overcome. No. It's more of an internal overcoming of your frustration. So there's external hurdles and then there's internal hurdles that will happen here. Um, you know, and as any future business owner or anyone looking to open a business here, those are the things that I, you know, there's a couple of sayings here. It's like prepare for the worst. You expect the best, prepare for the worst. Um, 
It's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. <laughs> That's another big one. And just breathe and like, just know that it's like part of the cultural experience. Like if you have a list of like things and pros and cons and trade-offs to have this life, like put that in that column. Like that's in there. Mm -hmm. It's just in there. Expect weird clerical shit like this to happen. You cannot successfully achieve a decade of business here or any amount of time really without these things happening. They will happen. They're going to happen. Save yourself the stress of like overreacting to it. It sucks. It's just part of what happens here. And so what would you tell yourself? You know, you're stepping on the plane at 28, 10 years ago. All the experiences you have now, you know, what if you could sum up all the advice in the one sentence, what are you telling yourself? Um, yeah, I, I kind of think I would just paraphrase what I just said is like, it, it, buddy, you're gonna you're gonna come across some things. Remember to breathe. Patience is going to be your virtue. Expect the unexpected and just flow because there's a big energy here of just kind of flowing with life. And that's what a lot of people, the mentality that they have here, it's true because if you fight it, it's like we have a lot of riptides here. You will lose. <laughs> and that's, it's very symbolic of that. Like, it's like, go with it, swim out to the sides, come back around to safety. Mm -hmm. That's all you can do. It's all you can do. And because we tr we've tried all the avenues of like telling somebody how to do their job a little better. Trust me. They don't want to hear it. They do not want to hear it. And it does not get you any further along in that process. They're not like, Hey, thanks for telling me what I should be doing right now. You know what? You're right. Yeah. Let me do this differently. That does not happen. That's not how it goes. It's okay. It's unfortunate that that happened that way, but I'll be back this time. Mm -hmm. Um, so if I could say to, you know, my, my 28 year old self when I was getting back on the plane or the first time to come here, um, it would be that, you know, sit back, relax, enjoy the ride. It's going to get bumpy, but it's going to be worth it. Awesome. And is there, you know, for someone who wants to get into tourism, whether it's Costa Rica or somewhere else, I mean, aside from just doing it, is there anything else that you'd say is important to get started? Um, yeah. Um, I would say I, w I would do see, I'm, I was blessed enough um, personally to when I came here, Brian had already had the other business. So when we switched over to this, I was like afforded the opportunity to forego like all the original legal stuff. Um, and we kind of just switched our books over to paddle nine. So I'm fortunate in that capacity. Um, I have now, as we've been here for almost 11 years, like doing business, I've experienced a lot of those things now, but the original setup, um, I feel like it's important that somebody, um, a would-be business owner does that research because it is doing business here in the initial setup. Everything is far different than doing business in the United States, not far, but there are some, there are some changes. Um, and also just like there's a lot of overlapping with like the different bureaucracies that like have to put their hands on like paperwork and stuff like that. Like some of them are very similar to one another, but they have like small differences. Um, so I would just kind of expect that processes take longer than you're used to. If you're coming from the United States or something like that, and where like processes can be very expedited, that's what the United States is about. Like work hard, get quick results, fast, 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 hustle, hustle, hustle. This is not that like literally the lifestyle is don't, hustle, 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 enjoy life, move more slowly. And that like translates into how jobs are done. So I would think a, a big piece of like a piece of information that I would want someone to told me, and I kind of got that because Brian was already here, is that like, no matter how tricky the process seems like it's going to be like, just like you have to just, re you have to just settle into it. You got to settle into it. There's going to be so much stuff that you want to force and you just can't. So knowing that, and like, if you come to that situation as your as the first time as a business owner, just if it feels like one of those situations, it is, it is like, if it feels like if I was in the States, I could push through this in 24 hours, it's going to be a week here in Costa Rica, maybe longer, just recognize it for what it is. Realize that that is part of the culture. Don't do yourself any disfavors and like get stressed out about it. Don't get any more gray hair on it. Um, because it just, it just, it's just how it goes. And, um, the, 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 the country itself is like, if you show that you're a, a pillar and you do good things for the country, the country will do good things for you. 
Um, but there's a little bit of a gauntlet. You know, you, it's not just like you're immediately accepted as a new business owner. You know, like even the local community will not do that. You know, like Costa Ricans and people from Canada and other countries in the United States, you have to like prove that you're here, that you're resilient, that you have like thick skin and that there are situations that you can come get through and be a positive, you know, aspect attribute to the local community. And then you will have at your fingertips a lot of resources. That's the one thing I love about Manuel Antonio, small town, amazing community. Like there's so many great resources that I've had with that from friends and information. Once you show that you're here and you have that couth, like they will give you information. You can use your friends as resources and how to tackle, you know, this myriad of events that will come your way and how to overcome them the right way and efficiently. But um, that's it. You kind of just have to, uh, you're going to, you have to change the dial a little. If you're coming from the States, you can't operate like you're in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's it. I, I think the rest is kind of like, take it as it comes. But if you settle into those roles, knowing that things happen more slowly, um, the ride's bumpy, but it's ultimately very worth it. Um, I would have a good amount of reserves. I would have res some reserves. People think that they're like going to turn on the money machine. It doesn't happen that way here at all. Um, you do have to build a product. You do have to find um, a path for you without like, you know, creating waves with other people. There's a lot of competition. Um, and uh, I would say that like, it's just like anywhere, like you find a, you know, a niche need in the market and you create that solution and you, you know, you really believe in it. And then you find the people within the community that would like benefit from it and are kind of similar to it. And you create good relationships with them. Um, and that's one of the things about a small community is you can get to know the people within it and ask questions. Do not come here trying to reinvent the wheel because everyone comes here trying to reinvent the wheel. And it's cool. People can do it, like find your own thing. But everyone always has like this billion dollar idea that they're like, I'm going to take this place by storm. And it's like somebody's already coming. Yeah, just yeah. Like yeah. Don't, don't come with this like attack mentality. Come with like this. I have this good idea. I think it can fit very nicely like this puzzle piece instead of like, I'm going to destroy the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And so where, if someone wants to come on a tour with you, where can we find you on internet, Instagram? Where else can we find you? Um, real simply, I think any any search engine, if you just type in Paddle9, P-A-D-D-L-E, the number nine, and even Instagram is a big thing for us. Um, it showcases beautifully like all the stuff that we do. There's lots of reels. There's still photos and then it has links to all of our, it has like a link tree so you can go to all our other stuff. To our website, um, I would go to TripAdvisor, which like in all the stuff that I'm saying now is corroborated by people that have paid for our experiences and will tell you exactly the same. That's how my stories are even coming about. Um, but yeah, I think the best places to go are our are, are Instagram, our TripAdvisor, and then the website is uh, www.paddle.com. 9 the number 9 sup for stand up paddle.com paddle 9 sup.com um and then anything else that you would want to get from that information or and more stories on us you can find it there awesome well hey thank you for taking the time to be with us today i know we got you getting right up yeah here. sorry a little steam might be listening to me too but hey I mean, that's that's part of the part of the nature of the beast right so I appreciate your time and uh really look forward to sharing your story and paddle dime with with the world yeah can't wait that. thank you very much for having me can't wait to see what you do with it brother awesome Oh, man. Thank you for watching this episode of Bizpirations. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so you're ready when the next episode comes out in two weeks. We'll see you then.